All right, here is chapter seven, part one, beginning the chapter on microbial metabolism. And the first four objectives here will be covered in section one, with objective one, all of those different terms would be covered throughout the entire uh, chapter. So really what we're going to talk about this first section is just the idea of catabolism and anabolism as part of the overall idea of metabolism and then enzymes and how enzymes are so important in the processes of the chemical reactions of metabolism. So you have metabolism and you probably are aware that having a high metabolism allows you to eat more because your metabolism is how your body utilizes the fuel that it, you give it. And if you have a low metabolism, then your body simply doesn't need as much energy, and so therefore you don't have to eat as much. Now, two major parts of metabolism, like I just mentioned, are anabolism. And anabolism is the assembly of different molecules. And to build something, you're going to need energy. And so anabolism requires the use of ATP, whereas catabolism is going to be the breakdown of material. You have some catastrophic event, and a building falls apart, or islands get demolished like, is, like has happened with the different hurricanes, and that's a catastrophic event. So catabolism is a breaking down of molecules, and this process is going to create ATP that can then hopefully be stored and utilized in the reverse process of anabolism. I like this figure that shows the overall process of metabolism because it's just rather simple but somewhat profound. On the left you have glucose and the y-axis is relative com the relative complexity of molecules and glucose is kind of right in the middle. And glucose is one of those molecules that is used often when talking about metabolism because it's very easy to, uh, well, it's used a lot for different cells, whether it's our cells or bacteria cells, and it's just simple. Um, so chemists and biologists and scientists have used that as an example to show this uh, process of metabolism and gaining energy. So glucose is going to be pulled into a cell or pulled into the system very much like we would eat a meal and then it goes to the process of catabolism and specifically with glucose you're talking about glycolysis, Krebs cycle, respiratory chain, and fermentation. This process is going to yield energy and in this process you're breaking glucose down into other molecules an example here are pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, glyceraldehyde-3P, and these are going to be precursor molecules that are going to fuel the process of anabolism. And you don't have to necessarily focus on glucose, but understand that this is what's happening with everything that we pull into our system or uh, what organisms are going to see as other sources of energy besides glucose. So now you're at the bottom of this curve here where you have your precursor molecules and now cells are going to move from catabolism over to the anabolism process. The cell is going to need energy to do this and it's going to take these very basic precursor molecules to create building blocks. The building blocks are amino acids, they can be sugars, nucleotides, fatty acids, and again, utilizing more energy, cells are going to create macromolecules, proteins, peptidoglycan, a major component of cell walls, the nucleic acids, and different complex lipids. All right, then um, the next step, and really the final step, is going to be actually creating the entire cell. And so the end product is going to be this bacterial cell. And really you've had three rounds of anabolism to just the one round of catabolism. 
But when you think about the big picture of metabolism, it's the sum of all of the chemical reactions that are allowing you to, or allowing your cells to survive. And you can think about that as this in terms of your own cells or the bacteria cell. All right, and in order for all of these different reactions to occur, you're going to need enzymes. And enzymes make life possible. And how or the reason for this is that chemical reactions um, aren't going to be able to proceed at a rate that's going to be sufficient with life, how fast we move, if there weren't enzymes to speed the rate of the reactions up. So this is a checklist of enzyme characteristics. Some of this might be reviewed for you. It just depends on what your background is. But enzymes are chemicals, or sorry, they are proteins. Right? That's what their nature is. And their job is to act as an, as an organic catalyst to speed up the rate of cellular reactions. Now, enzymes are very specific. All right, they have a specific shape that gives them specificity for a substrate, and therefore they have a specific function. There's not a lot of overlap with enzymes. And they enable metabolic reactions to proceed at a speed compatible with life. All right? Now, enzymes also have an active site, and that active site we'll see on the next slide is where the substrate is going to come in and allow the substrate and the enzyme to properly interact with each other and allow the reaction to occur. They're generally much larger than their substrate and um, they associate with the substrates but they don't become one product and they are not used up. They're not permanently changed by the reaction so they are recycled. Therefore you don't have to have a lot of these enzymes because once it does its thing, it releases its substrate and it can immediately lock onto a new substrate and perform that reaction. Enzymes are definitely affected by temperature and pH, which is why if you have a fever or if a child is left in a hot car, why there is worry about your body temperature going too high. Because when your body temperature goes high or too high, then your enzymes are being heated up. And because they are proteins, if they get heated, those uh, bonds within the amino acids and within the um, string of amino acids, the secondary structure, will start to fall apart. And therefore, enzymes will not function if they don't have their proper shape. So here's a picture of an enzyme. And this purple blob is the protein itself. Now, a lot of times enzymes will need a friend. All right, and the two examples here are a metabolic cofactor or a coenzyme. And this information is written on the next slide, but I'll just talk about it while we're looking at this figure. All right, so a coenzyme is going to be another protein, but you see it is much smaller than the apoenzyme, and the apoenzyme is just that large protein piece. And it's called an apoenzyme because there's two pieces. If there weren't two pieces and the enzyme worked all by itself, then it would just be called an enzyme. All right, me metabolic, or sorry, metallic cofactors uh, can also uh, play a role in terms of the, or allowing for the enzyme to be active and so these are the different friends that the enzyme might have. And sometimes it'll need two friends. So in this figure, you have both the metallic cofactor and the coenzyme. All right, so this is just what we mentioned on the previous slide, um, defining apoenzyme and the cofactors. All right, um, holoenzyme. All right, this guy right here, or actually all of them, um, would be considered the holoenzyme because the, the enzyme as a whole needs the main component and then these cofactors in order to work. All right, now here's the reaction of the enzyme substrate actually interacting and doing its thing. 
So here you have the enzyme, which is classified as E, and it has this specific shape here for the substrate to come in. If this blue and green guy wants to try to get into this enzyme, because of its shape, the two are not going to interact well, or at all, versus the shape of this orange and pink guy fits right in, and it allows for that physical interaction, and while the substrate is locked into the enzyme, it's going to facilitate that reaction. And here you have the two pieces of the product. And so um, I mentioned over here that the substrate locks into the enzyme. So sometimes you refer to or you hear enzymes in the substrates being referred to as the lock and key uh, theory, where you have a lock and you have a key. And if you put a key into the wrong lock, sometimes it won't even fit. Sometimes you can get the key in, but when you try to turn it, nothing happens because you have the wrong key in there. All right, here the enzyme is the lock, the substrate is the key, and you have to have both pieces, proper pieces, together in order for the reaction to occur. All right, so on the list of characteristics of proteins, there was the idea of or um, temperature and pH being mentioned. You can also add osmotic pressure. So you can feel this in your own body. All right, what happens if you have diabetes and it's unmanaged and a person goes into um, acidosis? All right, and that is because the pH in their blood has changed and they have a very acidic pH now relative to normal and their body doesn't work the right way. Uh, temperature, if your core temperature gets too high or too low, your body will start to shut down. And then osmotic pressure, if you are extremely dehydrated, your brain doesn't work as well. All right, that's because your enzymes are not able to function properly in these conditions. So you have to worry about temperature, you have to worry about pH, about water, in order to feel right. Now, denaturization, that is when the weak bonds that maintain the normal or native shape of the apoenzyme are broken. Right? Breaking those bonds disrupts the enzyme shape, and that prevents the substrate from attaching to the active site and therefore inhibiting the reaction. All right, enzymes can be um, controlled by two main mechanisms. The first is called competitive inhibition, and here it's just a composition or a competition. The normal substrate that fits into the enzyme, and then the competitor. Right, the competitor can actually fit into the active site of the enzyme, and if it does, this is what occurs, and it simply blocks the normal substrate from getting in, and it stops the reaction. All right, so nothing is occurring here. Non-competitive inhibition has a regulatory product. All right, the regulatory product is going to bind to a different site on the enzyme, and that physical bonding is going to alter the active site. And so here, um, without the regulator molecule, the active site is in the proper um, shape, and you can have the reaction occur. Over here, the reactor or regulatory molecule binds to the enzyme, and it alters the active site, and therefore the substrate cannot lock in, and that reaction is inhibited. All right, there are three main types of reactions, and they are a linear reaction, which means the reaction just occurs in a, a pretty straight line, where reaction, for, or you have A, and you have an enzyme that comes in and gives the product B, which feeds into the next reaction, C, and it's just a straight line. And this is what we're going to see with glycolysis. Then you have a cyclic reaction where pieces just keep fueling the process. All right, you've got U that turns into V, but Z over here at the end of this cyclic reaction will actually help to facilitate the continuing of this reaction. And then you have branched, all right, where there's two parts that either branch off from each other or come together.
And that is where we will stop section one.